I've been an adult for a while now, and in recent years, I find myself wondering why things are the way they are. And more specifically, were they always like this? You see, I'm a voter, and as any voter can tell you, politics are complicated. So complicated that most people don't even bother. I certainly haven't been immune to that fact. It's only in recent years that I've made an effort to understand certain policies and programs, which is way more difficult than you might think. And I'm forced to ask, why? The older generation of voters who have passed on their knowledge say that it's always been this way. Regardless of who or what you vote for, things are so complicated that nothing will ever really get done. But now the internet exists and I'm not sure that's true. Something changed in the early 70s and we've been dealing with the consequences ever since. It wasn't always this way. What happened? This video is brought to you by CuriosityStream and Nebula. Alyssa Rosenbaum was born in 1905 to a wealthy Jewish family in St. Petersburg, Russia. She grew up during World War I and the Russian Revolution. Times were tough and like many people, she retreated into fiction, specifically romantic novels. Not romance novels, get your mind out of the gutter. Romantic novels became popular during the Industrial Revolution. They glorified the past, emphasized the individual, and put characters in a fantastical situation rather than a realistic one. Her favorite book was The Mysterious Valley, written in 1914. To sum it up, while bringing civilization to the primitive tribes of India, several British military officers start disappearing one by one, presumably being picked off by tigers. It's a classic man versus nature story. But during the course of these adventures, it's discovered that the officers were alive and had been building their own utopia in a previously hidden valley. Valley, a completely original story that I'm sure will never be plagiarized. In 1921, Lenin and the Bolsheviks enacted the New Economic Policy, which confiscated and nationalized her father's pharmacy. This theft by the government became a rather formative experience. That same year, the Bolsheviks opened up universities to women for the first time, allowing her to attend Petrograd State University, where she majored in history and graduated in 1924. Then she studied screenwriting at the State Institute for Cinematography. That was also the same year Stalin came to power and many people, especially of Jewish heritage, were looking for reasons to leave. Alyssa Rosenbaum was granted a visa to visit relatives in the United States in 1925. She left her parents behind and arrived in New York in 1926. Upon seeing the Manhattan skyline, she decided she wanted to live here forever. There was a problem with that dream, though. The Johnson-Reed Act prevented most immigrants from getting jobs, especially Jewish immigrants. So she changed her name to Ayn Rand and moved to Hollywood to work as a screenwriter in the film industry. While working on the set of The King of Kings, she met Frank O'Connor and the two were married in 1929. When she first moved to Hollywood, most movies were silent films, and as they began the transition to talkies, her broken English became more and more of an issue. So she shifted her focus to writing novels and political activism. This was during the Great Depression and FDR's New Deal, which reinvigorated the economy through public works projects and welfare programs like Social Security. Rand viewed this as the first step towards a totalitarian communist regime. One of her first books, Anthem, written in 1937, imagines a future collectivist dystopia where the concept of the individual has been abolished. Even the word I has been erased from the dictionary. All of the characters use neutral or plural pronouns like they and we. In 1943, she wrote The Fountainhead, which also explores the conflict between individualism and conformity. This was Ayn Rand's first real success as a novelist. Though the book had pretty disappointing sales at first, which sent Rand into a deep depression, which probably wasn't helped by her addiction to Benzedrine, on top of her rampant chain smoking. Sales finally took off after a film adaptation was made in 19. 1949, starring Gary Cooper. He was a pretty big deal, basically the Tom Cruise of his time. It follows an architect named Howard Rourke, who designs buildings in a modern style, while everyone else insists on using a classical Greek style. They even alter his buildings to conform with that standard. Now there's a touch of the new and a touch of the old, so it's sure to please everybody. The middle of the road. Why take chances when you can stay in the middle? The main characters play perfect 4D chess against the system and each other. Howard Rourke believes that charity is wasteful. Any man who works without payment is a slave. He's fighting to live for his own sake. My reward, my purpose, my life is the work itself. My work done my way. Nothing else matters to me. In this world, each man subordinates himself to the standards of the majority 
reducing their talent to make it subservient to the masses. Innovation is bad, conformity is good. It's important to note that no real country acts like this. Nobody enforces strict conformity and architectural standards. Well, except for us now, apparently. The Fountainhead is Trump's favorite book, by the way. But okay, no country takes it to the ridiculous extreme that's presented in this book. Not even Soviet Russia. Though you wouldn't know that if you only ever listened to Ayn Rand. In 1947, she testified before the House Un-American Activities Committee, where she accused the Christmas movie It's a Wonderful Life of being communist propaganda, since it portrays bankers in a negative light. She also describes Russians as mindless drones who would barely know what to do with freedom if they had it. That uh, that's a great uh, change from the Russians I have always known. I've known a lot of them. Don't they do things at all like Americans? Don't they walk across town to visit their mother-in-law or somebody? Look, it's very hard to explain. It's almost impossible to convey to a free people what it's like to live in a totalitarian dictatorship. I can tell you a lot of details. I can never completely convince you because you are free. This was exactly what Americans wanted to hear during the Red Scare. In the years after World War II, the world was consumed with the ideological battle between Western capitalism and Soviet communism. And thanks to people like Ayn Rand, our understanding of Soviet Russia was cartoonishly evil. To the point that we had to be everything they are not. If they're atheists, we're Christian. If they're collectivists, we're individualists. And if they're communists, we should be capitalists. The thing is, the Soviets were never really communists. They were working towards it, but they never quite got there. There has never been a completely communist country or a capitalist one for that matter. Since the New Deal, America has adopted liberalism with a capital L as its economic model, which is a mixed economy with regulated capitalism. This is different from being socially liberal or conservative. If communism is on the left end of the spectrum and capitalism is on the right, liberalism lands somewhere around here. Ayn Rand saw this as just a step away from socialism. She wanted America to adopt the purest form of capitalism, which had been demonstrated to be the best system in well, there are no examples of pure capitalism. Which is why Ayn Rand invented one. Atlas Shrugged was published in 1957 and takes place in a future dystopian version of America, which most people just view as this America. And here's my first real problem with this book. Most dystopian novels depict a system controlled by elites that needs to be broken or at least navigated by an average person like you or me. Modern examples include The Hunger Games, Divergent, and even movies like Equilibrium and Snowpiercer. But even back in the day, books like Brave New World and 1984 depicted dystopias where the hero is an average person working against the system. Even Anthem and The Fountainhead follow that formula. In Atlas Shrugged, the average person is the bad guy. This book doesn't depict a system run by elites that needs to be dismantled. It's a system that needs to be implemented. The elite few at the top are the heroes of this story. I'm not just picking on some random work of fiction either. This is a lot of people's favorite book, especially politicians for some reason. It's regarded almost as highly as the Bible. And this isn't a thought experiment about how the world might look someday. It's a blueprint for how the world should look. These are ideas that people want to make happen. So before we get to those ideas, yes I did. It's 1,069 pages, nice, and took 56 hours to get through. Basically the entire month of January. I bring this up because I'm going to have to skip over most of the plot in order to cover the main political points. I'm not going to go into the finer details of the story, but just know that I did read it. I even watched the movies, which are universally regarded as terrible. Which brings me to my second point. The economic model suggested in this book is only possible because of the dystopian setup. A setup which is conspicuously absent from the movies. In this version of the world, humanity has suffered a severe cognitive decline. Most people are completely incapable of making any sort of independent decisions. They can't even drive through a broken stoplight. That's how bad things have gotten. The entire economy is kept going by the elite producers, the industrialists the men of action or men of the mind. These are the only people capable of innovation and independent thought. Because of this intellectual and economic crisis, the government tries to keep things afloat through regulation and taxation, which is why the main characters refer to them as looters, in contrast to the average person, which are viewed as parasites. Since this setup is missing from the movies, the government is turned into a bunch of mustache twirling villains who just get in the way. It shouldn't surprise you to hear that Ayn Rand believes in social Darwinism 
The people at the top are there because they deserve to be. And if you're at the bottom, that's your fault. She doesn't view poor people as a class, but rather as a collection of individual failures. If only you worked hard enough, you could be a producer too. The main protagonist of the story is Dagny Taggart, a female railroad executive struggling to keep her trains moving against an increasingly lazy workforce and an overbearing government. Luckily, she's uniquely smart enough to predict what the looters will do and plan accordingly. She assumes that the people's state of Mexico will nationalize one of her lines, so she pulls all of her best assets out of the country and intentionally lets it fall into disrepair. And she was right, they eventually do nationalize it. But think about that from Mexico's perspective. They just watched someone mismanage a railroad until it became pretty Pretty much worthless. It's almost a self-fulfilling prophecy. One of the other main characters is Hank Reardon, an industrialist who invents a new kind of metal that's stronger and lighter than steel. He humbly names it Reardon Metal, but it might as well be unobtainium. This new product is so threatening to the wider steel industry that the State Science Institute lies about its safety in order to preemptively ban it from coming to market. The government using science to hinder innovation. Hmm. Because of the government ban, the Railroad Workers Union decides that it won't let any of its employees operate trains on lines made with Reardon metal. Thankfully, Dagny saw through the government lies. She creates a shell corporation and hires scabs to illegally build a new railroad out of unobtainium anyway which she names the John Galt Line. And it's so successful that it threatens the wider railroad industry. So the union and the government impose unnecessary nationwide safety regulations like a speed and weight limit, which in practice only applies to the new John Galt Line. Who is John Galt is a meme which people use to explain away the unexplainable. Why are people getting dumber and lazier? Who is John Galt? Why is the government so grossly incompetent? Who is John Galt? Dagny only chose the name out of spite. She hates the phrase. Her railroad continues to suffer because of overregulation and the fact that all of the great men of the mind have been slowly disappearing one by one. She attributes the disappearances to a man she calls the Destroyer and starts hunting for him. Narratively, the book feels a lot like Dante's Inferno. Dagny and Hank travel around and come across destitute people who have entire prepared speeches about what went wrong in their life, almost always shifting the blame for their misfortunes onto others. During one of these chance encounters, they travel to an abandoned factory and find a prototype free energy motor, which converts atmosphere static electricity into usable energy. But it's missing parts and doesn't work. Realizing what this could do for her railroad, and I suppose the rest of the world, Dagny and Hank make it their mission to find the original inventor. And this is where that dystopian setup gets in the way. Everyone they question about the motor is dumb as rocks and can't remember anything, not even the name of their former supervisor. It's like pulling teeth to get any information out of them. But the general story is that the 20th century motor company decided to collectivize or turn themselves into a worker co-op. Everyone works according to their ability and is paid based on their need. As you might have guessed, the workers become lazy and start having kids or bringing an extended family just to increase their apparent need. They even fake illnesses to receive disability payments. This led to an overall brain drain at the factory as the few men of the mind resigned in protest. One of those people being John Galt, who vowed to stop the motor of the world as he left. More captains of industry disappear, and the government begins nationalizing industries under unification boards and passing laws to prevent any single business from gaining too much power. Then they passed Directive 10289. This brings the entire economy under government control. Your job will be chosen by committee, and you cannot quit. They freeze production and wages and seize all patents and trademarks. They also outlaw any new products. They don't want the economy to be at the mercy of every stray crank with a new idea. Dagny wasn't able to find the original inventor of the motor, but she hired a scientist who was in the process of reverse engineering it. Then he was visited by the destroyer and disappears. Dagny chases after him in a plane, she's also a pilot, don't worry about it, and follows him into a hidden valley in Colorado, which is protected by a Wakanda-like ray shield. She crashes, survives, and is greeted by John Galt, who is revealed to be the destroyer and the inventor of the free energy motor. She also meets all of the missing men of the mind. Turns out they all abandon their lives in the outside world to go on strike and come to this hidden valley they named Galt's Gulch to create a capitalist utopia. A completely original story that will never be- wait. You see, this is a world of great man economics. When the CEO of an oil or coal company disappears, nobody is able to step up and take their place. If they take their ball and go home, 
the game ends. Most everyone else is too stupid to be able to do their job. Even their immediate subordinates have no clue what to do. The industrialists are uniquely gifted. Sometimes on their way out, they literally blow up their factories and mines so nobody else can even try to get things going. So were they fleeing the collapse or causing it? Here in Galt's Gulch, they only use gold as their currency, they all smoke cigarettes with little dollar signs on them, and they're using the free energy motor as a limitless source of electricity. Nothing created in the valley is allowed to leave. The people are allowed to leave, though. A few of them had even taken on menial day laborer jobs in the outside world to keep tabs on what's going on. Being a day laborer is the lowest, most degrading job imaginable to them. In order to pay for her care following the plane crash, Dagny becomes John Galt's house slave, which isn't much better. And then she enters into a sexual relationship with him. Here's where I need to talk about Ayn Rand's problematic depiction of women. Not just in this book, but all of her work. Marriage is completely meaningless in this world. Everyone cheats on everyone, everyone knows about it, and nobody gets in trouble. Dagny shifts her attraction to whoever is the most alpha male in her life at that moment. She starts with Francisco Danconia, a copper tycoon, then moves on to Hank Reardon, the steel tycoon who invents Reardon metal, and then John Galt. All of the sex scenes are kind of rapey. We're experiencing the story from Dagny's perspective, so we're able to hear her thoughts. Turns out she's one of those women who likes to be taken and puts on a show of not wanting it, all while secretly enjoying it. This same scenario plays out in The Fountainhead. She even fights back before giving in to his aggressively violent advances. But it's okay, she's apparently into that. Now, I don't think that reading this book will turn anyone into a rapist or inspire someone to commit a sexual assault. But your brain is really bad at differentiating between reality and fiction. We are social animals, and we evolve to absorb gossip as a way to keep tabs on the community without having to physically see everything ourselves. Who is sleeping with who, who was lazy on the last hunt, etc. Whenever you hear one of these stories or read it in a book, your brain logs that as an example regardless of whether or not it happened to you. That's why crime dramas are so effective. So let's say you're sitting on a jury and you hear someone say, man I didn't assault anybody, she secretly wanted it. You see the way she was dressed? That's that's true, some women do be like that. No they don't actually, not without telling you first anyway. And that's really my problem with this entire book. This is fiction, none of this stuff actually happened. The people aren't this lazy and stupid, and the government isn't this incompetent and corrupt. But people act like this is the world we currently live in. Some people are just more gifted and motivated than others, and lazy people will always find a way to mooch off of them, even using the government to make everything unfairly equal. To pull an example from the book, anti-discrimination laws are abused to force banks to give loans to poor people, because you can't discriminate against the economically disadvantaged, right? Where have I heard this before? Some government planners decided that too few people owned homes. So the planners decided to force an increase in home ownership. They lowered lending standards for people seeking a mortgage. This produced a glut of subprime loans and subprime borrowers. Is that how it happened? The government held a gun up to the bank's heads and forced them to give loans to people who couldn't afford them? Of course not, but it sounds plausible because you read a similar story in Atlas Shrugged. What really caused the housing crash of 2008 was deregulation of the financial industry, which is John Galt's ideal economy. He spells it out in excruciating detail when he takes over the radio waves and delivers a 60-page monologue that, in-universe, takes over three hours. As as if any of the parasites would sit through that. He tells everyone what they're doing wrong, that they're doomed, and then he and the rest of the producers wait out the coming dark age in their hidden valley. America then descends into anarchy. By the end, people are using wagons again. The collapse of civilization isn't something to be avoided. It's framed as deserved and even necessary so that the men of the mind can come back and rebuild. They watch the world burn so that they could become rulers over the ashes. The final scene is the industrialists planning out their new vision for America, even adding a new clause to the Constitution. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of production and trade. Ayn Rand believed in a separation between the state and the economy. The government just needs to get out of the way. There are only three things the government should be doing. The police, to protect individual rights and property rights from within. The military, to protect those rights from without and the courts to resolve disputes. All those New Deal welfare programs need to go. In 1950s America, a lot of people agreed. She started gathering followers and formed the collective, which became somewhat of a cult. She would personally disagree with calling it a cult, but when you look at some of the things they were required to believe, 
it seems pretty culty. The group included people like Alan Greenspan, Leonard Peikoff, and Nathaniel Brandon, who would go on to form various think tanks and institutes of their own. There was actually quite a bit of drama within the group too. Ayn Rand, who was married, started having an affair with her student Nathaniel Brandon, who was also married, but she called it off and kicked him out of the group when she discovered he was sleeping with a third person, a person she viewed as inferior to herself. That's why she ended it according to her not jealousy. Objectivism is the philosophy Ayn Rand and her group of loyal followers pushed with her lectures and writings in the years after Atlas Shrugged. Its basic beliefs are conveyed in John Galt's three-hour speech. But since I don't expect any of you to go read or listen to it, it's summed up by the oath the producers have to take before entering Galt's Gulch. I swear by my life and my love of it that I will never live for the sake of another man, nor ask another man to live for mine. According to objectivism, the greatest evil in the world is the the philosophy of altruism. So, what is altruism? Remember that altruism does not mean benevolence or consideration for other men. Altruism is a moral theory which preaches that man must sacrifice himself for others, that he must place the interests of others above his own, that he must live for the sake of others. I'm pretty sure it's that first one. Not everything needs to be catastrophically all or nothing. Nobody's asking you to sacrifice yourself. This is a common theme in objectivism. Ayn Rand regularly uses circular logic to invent private, self-reinforcing definitions of words. Let's take a look at a few examples. Which philosophy answers the question, is man free? Capitalism is the only system that answers yes. Capitalism is a social system based on the recognition of individual rights including property rights, in which all property is privately owned. This is a private definition of capitalism. Regardless of what dictionary you use, they all talk about private property, but none of them mention individual rights. She added that part to make it seem like the only system to include freedom. Capitalism is the only system based on an objective theory of values. What is an objective theory of values? It's the rational conclusion one comes to after evaluating the facts of reality in relation to man. It's not subjective or intrinsic, it's objective. Which means if you don't agree with the objective reality as I see it, you're being irrational and I don't have to listen to you. I didn't make that up. That's Ayn Rand's actual approach to people who disagree with her. A company- This is what I don't answer. Oh, wait I'll a say, minute, you haven't heard the question yet. She's well, already estimated her position my, and my work, incidentally, displaying the quality of her brain. In you your philosophy, I'll show last here. You want to create an incident? No. No. Pa no. Pass it up. I don't regard this as a legitimate question. I know what kind of movement is behind that sort of junk. Well, since she isn't alive anymore, she can't stop me from taking a look at one of her examples. It can be rationally proved that the airplane is objectively of a measurably greater value to man, to man at his best, than the bicycle. Can it be proved that an airplane is of objectively greater value? It seems obvious until you think about it. I'm pretty sure that's subjective. The mere fact that intelligent people can disagree about this proves that it's not objective, or that they're not intelligent, I guess. If the stenographer spends all her money on cosmetics, and has none left to pay for the use of a microscope for a visit to the doctor. When she needs it, she learns a better method of budgeting her income. The free market serves as her teacher. So if you don't make the objectively correct choice according to Ayn Rand and you irrationally choose to buy lipstick instead of saving for a doctor, I guess you'll die then. As you might have guessed, this heartless approach was somewhat of a shock to most Americans in the 50s. Here in the United States, perhaps the most challenging and unusual new philosophy has been forged by a novelist, Ayn Rand. Ms. Rand's point of view is still comparatively unknown in America, but if it ever did take hold, it would revolutionize our lives. If you are out to destroy almost every edifice in the contemporary American way of life, our Judeo-Christian religion, our modified government-regulated capitalism, our rule by the majority will, other reviews have said that you scorn churches and the concept of God. Are these accurate criticisms? 
Uh, yes. In most of her interviews at the time, her atheism takes center stage. Phil Donahue even grilled her on it in 1980. That's how recently being an atheist was still seen as weird. But they also take issue with her views on social welfare. You don't go for altruism and charity and do good and liberal and... Hell, I want to help people. I want to do good for other people. What's so bad about that? Nothing. If you do it by your own choice, and if it's not your primary aim in life, and if you don't regard it as a moral virtue. Ayn Rand doesn't believe in taxation for the common good, which is a concept that she views as undefinable and will just lead to more and more theft in the name of society. Another undefinable concept to her. There is no such entity as the tribe or the public. The tribe or the public or society is only a number of individual men. Now you know where Margaret Thatcher got the idea. She views society and class as a group of individuals who are free to prosper or fail on their own merit. If everyone just acted selfishly, all of civilization would be improved. People should be free to profit as much as they can, doing whatever it is they want, as long as it doesn't interfere with the rights of others. All economic transactions should be voluntary, which means the right to disagree or refuse is key to her philosophy. If you're forced to work for someone, that's basically slavery. Part of me wants to agree with this, but it kind of assumes that everyone has good intentions. We know where the right to refuse leads us. People won't grant marriage certificates or bake wedding cakes for gay couples. They won't offer birth control in their health insurance. And if the majority of Americans still had their way and still had the right to refuse, segregation would still be a thing. Sometimes the invisible hand must be forced because some of you are still stuck in the past. Ayn Rand viewed the Civil Rights Act of 1964 as a violation of property rights. You can't force businesses to serve black people, in case you were wondering why so many white people were drawn to this message. As a result, her cold, selfish philosophy of objectivism didn't really catch on in mainstream American politics. Neither party was willing to adopt its ideas. All that changed in 1971 when a group of free thinkers voluntarily associated with each other and created the Libertarian Party. The first election they took part in was 1972. Ayn Rand never liked libertarians, dismissing them as right-wing hippies. All kinds of people today call themselves libertarians, especially something calling itself the New Right, which consists of hippies who are anarchists instead of leftist collectivists, but anarchists are collectivists. Capitalism is the one system that requires absolute objective law, yet libertarians combine capitalism and anarchism. That's worse than anything the New Left has proposed. It's a mockery of philosophy and ideology. This is despite their obvious similarities with Rand. Libertarians tend to be atheists and believe in individual liberty, which means they were pro-choice and for the decriminalization of drugs, both of which were very unpopular opinions at the time. Therefore, a purely free market, laissez-faire form of capitalism and limiting or reducing the size of government, which was starting to catch on thanks to her books. They were also for ending conscription. National service should be voluntary. You shouldn't have to sacrifice yourself for some undefinable common good. But public service has always been part of our national identity. From the founding fathers, I only regret that I have but one life to give for my country, to JFK's ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. All that changed with the Vietnam War. Thanks to the release of the Pentagon Papers in 1971, Americans were starting to realize that serving your country might mean being sent off to the other side of the world to die for nothing. Though some would argue that that was always the case. Suddenly, America's attitude towards war well, it changed. Nixon campaigned to end the war and the draft, both times he was elected. He eventually made good on that promise, though technically not until after he resigned in 1973. The military has been an all-volunteer force ever since. If you were born after 1955, the draft isn't something you've ever had to worry about. But the anti-war movement brought another related issue to light. You could be sent off to war before you were able to vote. You could be drafted at 18, but couldn't vote until you were 21. So in 1971, the 26th Amendment was added to the Constitution, lowering the voting age to 18, specifically for the baby boomers who were now coming of age. The first election these teenagers could participate in was 1972. And one of their main issues of concern was the environment. 
The air and water had become so polluted that rivers regularly caught on fire. All that changed in 1970 with the first Earth Day. In response to these demonstrations, Nixon created the Environmental Protection Agency, and a few years later he signed the Endangered Species Act, which quickly got to work preserving our land and wildlife. A lot of corporations saw this as excessive government regulation needlessly hamstringing industrial progress. Did we really need to create more federal agencies? But at the same time, he was spinning off federal agencies into independent corporations. The post office used to be a department of the government. All that changed with the Postal Reorganization Act of 1970, which allowed the Postal Service to change prices and salaries without an act of Congress. For decades afterwards, the Postal Service was actually turning a profit. The debate started to shift to whether the post office should be run as a business or a service, and whether the government should be in charge of that service at all. Unlike the police, which is one of the few government entities endorsed by Ayn Rand. Police forces didn't really exist until the late 1800s. Even then, they were mostly local entities keeping the peace in their community. All that changed in 1971 when Nixon declared a war on drugs. This popularized the use of militarized police units, or SWAT teams, no-knock warrants, and a practice known as civil asset forfeiture, which became a great source of revenue for police departments. The war on drugs also unlocked federal funds for police to buy equipment and provide anti-drug education in schools. Man, remember D.A.R.E.? Remember Scruff McGruff? Ooh, I remember. Remember holidays and long weekends? Well, that actually didn't start until 1971, when the Uniform Monday Holiday Act went into effect. We always had holidays like Christmas and Thanksgiving, but now we had more. This act made Memorial Day, Labor Day, and Columbus Day federal holidays, and fixed our position on the calendar to a Monday, giving us three-day weekends. As the saying goes, in 1492, Columbus gave us a day off of school, and in 1971, Nixon gave it to everyone. Which kind of devalues it, right? It's not special if everyone gets it. Devaluing stuff was kind of Nixon's thing. The dollar used to be worth a set amount of gold. You used to be able to go into a bank and convert it. All that changed in 1971 with the Nixon shock. Now it's a free-floating fiat currency that's just worth a dollar. It could collapse at any moment. Which is why Ayn Rand said that gold is the only objective currency. Which I just happen to be selling. So come on by and trade in your worthless paper money for something a little more valuable. Or you could use it on goods and services, I guess. In 1971, Nixon officially recognized the Communist Government of China which opened up trade between our two countries. Now we have all sorts of cheap products to choose from. What am I doing here? These are Japanese. You do know there's a difference, right? Besides, you're talking about politics, which I have nothing to do with. There are no politics in sports. I mean, it would be ridiculous if this whole thing started with a shoe video that none of you watched. Jogging as an exercise wasn't a thing until 1967. That's when Bill Bowerman released his popular book, but most people didn't have the proper shoes to use the techniques he suggests. All that changed in 1972 with the release of the Nike Cortez. There was a lot going on in the country at the time, and people needed a recreational outlet to vent off their frustrations. So 5Ks, 10Ks, and marathons became a thing. Initially, women weren't allowed to participate because it was thought that running for an extended period of time would tear their reproductive organs. But in 1972, Title IX was passed, providing funding for women's sports. That same year, the New York City Marathon finally allowed women to compete as long as they started 10 minutes before the men. Now everyone can enjoy running, as long as you have the right equipment anyway. Women who are used to wearing high heels should probably start with a pair of flats. And maybe a skirt? Women seem to perform best when they feel well-dressed. Heh, <laughs> that guy knows what's up. I mean, if you're gonna be equal, you might as well look good while doing it, right? This all happened during second wave feminism, otherwise known as the women's liberation movement. Though I don't know why, what do they need to be liberated from? Being a housewife is the easiest job in the world. I mean, unless they want a divorce or something. Which used to be a lot harder to accomplish since women weren't allowed to have their own bank accounts, credit cards, or mortgages. All that changed in 1974 and not for the better, if you ask me. It used to be that if you wanted a divorce, you had to have a good reason, like infidelity, domestic abuse, or even impotence. Not a problem I'm familiar with. But thanks to feminism, many states started allowing no-fault divorces, which means the only way you can keep them around is if you knock them up. All that ch
You know these are bad for you, right? Secondhand smoke is a myth. Just because Ayn Rand says it doesn't make it true. Oh, you didn't know that's where that comes from? She even got lung cancer in 1974 and still denied the link. Anyway, the birth control pill had been widely available since 1960, and that began America's moral decline, which was capped off by the Roe v. Wade decision in 1973. This legalized abortion across the United States. Life begins at conception. Babies aren't a mistake that you can just erase. They're a gift from God and and we need to protect them. America is a Christian nation, after all. Yeah, not like those Arabs in the Middle East, am I right? During the various Arab-Israeli conflicts in the 60s and 70s, America threw its support behind Israel, causing the Arab oil embargo in 1973. The Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries stopped selling oil to the United States, causing gas prices to skyrocket, shortages around the country, and even rationing. This is why we've increased our domestic production. Eventually, Nixon was able to get OPEC to agree to exclusively price their oil in dollars, creating the petrodollar, which has kept our currency mostly stable ever since. It's good to know that we have strong leadership in the White House. All that changed after Watergate in 1973. You see, after the 1968 DNC riots, both parties decided to reform the way they choose their candidates making the process more democratic. They used to be chosen by party insiders. So when people say Nixon swept the country in 1972, that is true. But that was also the first election that allowed 18-year-olds to vote. And it was the first to use the current primary election system. Nixon's campaign figured out how to use that to make sure McGovern was his opposition, because polling showed that he was the weakest candidate. That's what the break-in at the Watergate Hotel was about. Watergate is probably a video in itself. Come to think of it, just about everything I've talked about is a video in itself. Someone should really get on that. Anyway, Nixon resigned in disgrace in 1974 and was replaced by Gerald Ford, who became president without a single electoral vote cast in his name. Yes, just like Frank Underwood. To prevent another Watergate, the Federal Election Commission was established in 1975 establishing the current campaign finance rules. Now we can rest assured that our elections have integrity. The first election to take place under the FEC's watchful eye occurred a year later between Ford and Carter. That's why they made him give up his peanut farm. These rules were new. But ultimately, there were very few differences between these two candidates. They were both liberals with a capital L, and the economy had been pretty stagnant for a while. Every president since FDR had been a liberal. The millions of people who read Ayn Rand's work were ready to try something new but there weren't any major candidates who held libertarian or objectivist views. All that changed in 1976. Hello friends, my name is JJ. So the Libertarian Party had proven a gigantic flop. Their presidential candidate had only won a measly 3,000 votes in the 1972 presidential election and subsequent elections weren't much better. In fact, it wasn't until 2016 that the Libertarians even passed 1% in the popular vote. Likewise, in 50 years of existence, they've only ever elected five state legislators, including one in 2020. Atlas Shrugged was a bestseller, but orthodox libertarian theory wasn't exactly winning the hearts and minds of voters. America may have been in the midst of all sorts of disorienting and increasingly unpopular changes, but a lot of what the Libertarians had to say about foreign policy and drugs and religion and gender was and to a large degree remains broadly disliked by much of the American public. But luckily, there was another hot new ideology on the rise, an ideology capable of taking the popular parts of libertarianism and cutting out all of the weird stuff, an ideology known as conservatism. While there have always been right-wingers in American politics, in the sense of people who just dislike change or support the status quo, the idea of conservatism as a coherent philosophy was very much a post-war phenomenon. This movement, what Rand had sneeringly called the New Right, also known as the Neoconservatives, was backed by a coalition of discrete groups from American life, forming the so-called stool with three legs, national security conservatives, social conservatives, and fiscal conservatives. National security conservatives, or hawks, are basically just people who believe that America should have an aggressively interventionist foreign and military policy. In the context of the Cold War, this meant doing whatever it took to curb the power of the Soviet Union and the spread of communist regimes. The two things the Hawks believed posed the biggest danger to American safety and international peace. And after the loss of Vietnam, Nixon's recognition of Red China, and the spread of Marxist governments across the Third World, there were a lot of Americans who felt the commies were clearly gaining the 
upper hand. Social conservatives, meanwhile, were religious Americans who opposed many of the social reforms that had taken place over the last couple of decades. The liberalization of divorce, the mainstreaming of porn, pot, homosexuality, and of course, abortion. Evangelical and fundamentalist Christians in particular had begun to make themselves a more aggressive presence in American culture beginning in the 1970s through the televangelism craze, which saw charismatic preachers get their own TV shows and speak directly to the American public. You can learn more about it in my award-winning video about the rise of the Christian right. And then as the third leg of the stool, you have the fiscal conservatives. These were basically libertarians, but confined to the one area where they were taken the most seriously. Now, Ayn Rand, in her cuddly cast of characters, obviously had no shortage of theories about how the American economy should be run. But by the 1970s, you no longer had to rely on some made-up railroad middle manager to hear a robust defense of capitalism. There were now living, breathing John Galtz out there, capable of giving their own three-hour lectures on why America's real-life economic woes were the result of liberal government policy. The list included a growing number of respected economists, including Milton Friedman, the author of Capitalism and Freedom, and a firm believer that the private sector could do almost anything better than the government, and that state regulation almost always caused more problems than it solved. I believe the FDA, as it has been operating, has, been, has, has done vastly more harm than good. Arthur Laffer, whose famous curve posited that America's high tax rates were discouraging success and immiserating the government since productive Americans would actively avoid pursuing opportunities that could wind up putting them in a higher tax bracket. Is not whether or not we raise taxes, but how much we're going to lower them next term. And George Gilder, author of Wealth and Poverty, who argued that American welfare had grown so generous there was no longer much incentive for the poor to work their way out of poverty. That the state financially punish the virtuous mother in order to make her subsidize the mother who pushes her children aside. One thing that Rand certainly did get right is that there was a lot of business support for this stuff as well. Now, some have always claimed that the conservative stool is inherently unstable. I mean, what do anti-statist capitalists have in common with fundamentalist Christians and militant cold warriors? Well, quite a few things, actually. Take opposing the Soviet Union, the big issue of the hawks. The USSR was not only a geopolitical threat to the United States, it was also the world's leading exemplar of socialist economics and godly atheism. So the other two legs of the stool certainly saw their values reflected in that crusade. Or how about the cause of shrinking the government, the most important thing to the fiscal cons? Well, limiting the size of its government was another way America could prove its deep commitment to the anti-socialist cause, which the Hawks liked as well as preventing the government from making any further changes to American social norms, which the SOCONs liked. And upholding Christian values? Well, that also helped reinforce America's anti-communist bona fides, but it also encouraged the importance of things like family, community, and charity, which fiscal conservatives often claimed would fill the vacuum after the New Deal welfare state was hollowed out. By the late 1970s, the leaders of all three factions of this conservative coalition, the televangelists, the cold warriors, and the free market economists, were starting to line up behind one man who seemed uniquely equipped to rescue America from the clutches of liberalism, Ronald Wilson Reagan. Reagan, a former Hollywood actor, had been a strident anti-communist in the 50s, served as California's right-wing business-friendly governor in the 60s, and was a born-again Christian to boot. All three factions saw him as their guy, especially the economic libertarians. Friedman, Laffer, and Gilder all served as economic advisors to Reagan, with Gilder's book about poverty, even dubbed the Bible of Reaganism, given how much Ronnie loved it. In fact, even that guy from the PragerU video helped him with debate prep. Reagan repeatedly ran for president, first in a long shot bid in 1968, and then a more credible one in 1976, where he made use of the new primary system in an attempt to wrestle the Republican nomination from President Ford. Most of his adult life, he has been a part of the Washington establishment. Most of my adult life has been spent outside of government. But he kept failing, and many political analysts of the time concluded that Reagan and his conservative coalition simply represented the most extreme, unelectable, right-wing faction of the Republican Party. All that changed in 1980. Jimmy Carter was elected in 1976, and he gave it his best shot, but he was just more of the same. 
liberalism, complete with another Arab oil embargo and a hostage crisis in 1979. The economy was stagnant, our morals had deteriorated, and America was losing respect on the international stage. It was time for strong leadership in the White House. So we elected someone who promised to make America great again. It's like we're living in an episode of Black Mirror and everything's repeating. Ayn Rand famously denounced Reagan over religion and economics. What do I think of President Reagan? The best answer to give would be, but I don't think of him. And the more I see, the less I think. And Mr. Reagan in particular is not an advocate of capitalism. He is an advocate of a mixed economy with a different kind of mixture. That different mixture was America's shift from liberalism to neoliberalism. This meant reducing the overall amount of government regulation in the economy, cutting social welfare programs, reducing taxes on the wealthy, and union busting. Government is not the solution to our problem. Government is the problem. In 1981, the Air Traffic Controllers Union went on strike for better pay and working conditions, and rather than negotiate, Reagan fired almost all of them. Rather quickly, state governments and private corporations realized that they could do the same. Being a grocery store clerk used to be a job that you could retire on. You could afford college after working there for a summer. And the reason minimum wage was allowed to stay so low for so long was that there was an expectation that your job would provide benefits on top of that, like health insurance, sick leave, paid vacation, and a retirement. The thinking was that the free market would incentivize companies to offer those benefits in order to attract talent. But these benefits are expensive and eat into a company's profits. Since this was just an expectation and not a requirement, following Reagan's example, they realized that they could just stop offering them. Under neoliberalism, they had the right to refuse. So if you're working a minimum wage job and your employer decides to stop offering health insurance, it's on you to find a better job. And what happens to someone who, despite their sincerest efforts, just can't seem to get ahead? They start looking for explanations. Some outside group must be holding them back, whether it's feminists, the government, or, you know, them. Or they just blame themselves. Maybe if you weren't such a parasite relying on government handouts, you wouldn't be in this position. Some people are just gifted with that entrepreneurial spirit and others aren't. If your job isn't paying you enough or the video platform you use to host your business has too many restrictions, you should just create your own. Which is what a bunch of us educational creators did over on Nebula. Nebula is a subscription streaming utopia built by a voluntary association of YouTubers in a secluded valley, allowing us to innovate new ideas free of regulation by the algorithm. Them. All of my content is hosted over there ad-free, and viewers who watch this video over on Nebula get to see a few additional character appearances and alternate lines. Check it out by also signing up for Curiosity Stream, a subscription streaming service that offers thousands of documentaries and non-fiction titles which you can access across multiple platforms. Check out the Watergate episode of History to find out how a campaign finance violation changed literally everything. So head on over to curiositystream.com slash knowingbetter. For a limited time, you can get a subscription to both Curiosity Stream and Nebula for only $14.79 a year. It's in your rational economic self-interest to do so, but you'll also be supporting the channel when you do. We don't have a left-wing economic party in the United States. They may disagree on the finer details, but when it comes to the broad strokes of the economy, the Democrats and Republicans pretty much always agree. Every president since Reagan has been a neoliberal. The baby boomers came of age in the 70s and they changed the entire government to match their ideology. And then they never let go of that power. They completely froze Generation X out of politics. Sure, they gave us some good music and pop culture, but name a Gen X politician. You can't. Name a millennial politician. Actually, never mind. We all thought of the same person, and she took office in 2019. We just elected another boomer president. Millennials are now the same age the boomers were when they elected Nixon and changed everything. They made it this way and then told us this is how it's always been. We're in our 30s now, and we're starting to realize that the system isn't working for everyone, and we're being told that it's our fault. We just aren't working hard enough. Huh. Well, it worked fine for me. Have you thought about adding some arch support? Maybe some gel injections? It might be your socks. What kind of socks are you wearing? Maybe it's the giant heel cushion that you introduced in the first place. I know you thought it would improve things and unlock your inner potential, but look at how many people are being hurt in the process. And none of the little modifications you've added over the years seem to be helping. Maybe it's time for this new generation of voters to consider going back to the way things were. Or, even better, try something new entirely. Anything is better than continuing to slam our heels into the ground. It hasn't always been this way. We can change it. And now, you know better. 
This video is the culmination of over a year's worth of work and would not have been possible without the input of fellow creators and my Discord community. There's been a lot of exciting things happening in the background of the channel, so if you'd like to be kept in the loop, would you kindly subscribe? Or consider voluntarily associating with me on Patreon. I'd like to give a shout out to my newest Golden Fork patrons, Zion, Clayton, Alex, and Nathan. If you'd like to add your name to this list of elite industrialists, head on over to patreon.com slash knowingbetter, or for a one-time donation, paypal.me slash knowingbetter. Don't forget to check out the merch at knowingbetter.tv, follow me on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and join us on the subreddit.